Electrician Live with your host, Paul Abernathy and Jay Brunberg. Oh, what up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Electrician Live. My name is Paul Abernathy, and with me, as always, my co-host from the wonderful high, mile high, Colorado, Mr. Jay Grunberg. Mr. Grunberg, welcome to the show, as always. What's up? There you go. And I will all have y'all all know that I made him take off his uh, his Seahawks stuff before we started this show because there's just no way, there's no way we could we could start that show with the Seahawks. See, oh. see, it doesn't see. even want to show up on screen. Uh. It doesn't even want to be show up. Anyway, everybody, welcome to the show. Dan, all the way from Brazil. Look at Woo! that. Jay, we're reaching Brazil up in the house. Thank you for joining us, Dan. Welcome. Um, I do see some other folks that are into the show for the first time uh, already. Uh, Christy says she's a, uh, or he, I guess, Christy, Christy, either, could be either or. And don't want to offend anybody. Hello and welcome. You're new yeah. to the game. Thank you for coming. Oh, as always, welcome. Um, so how's your week been, Jay? Give us a, give us a quick update uh, of, of your week. We got Austin in the house too. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, give, it, give us a rundown. How's the week? How's the week been in the old Mile High City uh, oh my area? I guess. I can tell you what. I am so glad that the rain has slowed down for a little bit and the sun decided to come out and shine its brightness today. Um, and actually, I got to work out in, outside in the sun, so I, I enjoyed it that much more. It wasn't muddy, and I was on a job, job site that's uh, new construction, so I didn't have to deal with the mud that I've been dealing with on the addition that we're doing at my place um, with the past few weeks with all the rain. So it's been a great week, man. We are we're we're kicking butt on the electrical side. Personally, we're go. we're kicking butt, and um, yeah, everything's good. About, about you, yeah, everything's all good on the Electrical Code Academy front. A lot of students coming in. Everybody doing good. We have exam preps on Wednesday nights. Everybody's doing good. Uh, so again, which it's, I uh, did make, which I you did, did make, make. you did, night. you were there last night. Yep. And helped me out as always. Uh, again, Man, appreciate it. Was it. Good. it was good yeah. seeing O and Elwood, Elwood in the yeah. house from California. Yeah. Um, look, look at the people. We got Jacob in from Missouri, <laughs> uh, Missouri. Stephen from Austin, right down the road from me, right down in Austin, right? Just a hop skip San Antonio. Also just a hop skip right down the road. Guys, we got to do some kind of. Jay, I got to do some kind of annual meetup or something. Get all, you know, find somewhere to meet up in Texas and we all meet up, have some good old Texas barbecue and talk code and, and just meet up, that type of thing or something. Maybe I bring some books down there and give away or something. We got to do something. Anyway, thank you, everybody. Coming for, from the British Virginia Islands. Wow. Yeah, Virgin Islands. Man. Virginia, Earth. he said it again. He had, he had his bidet, <laughs> pate, bidet. He had his moment already. Uh, let's see. We, Hector? That's, Round Rock. Word. Round Rock. Right down the road. Round Rock. I assume that's Round Rock, Texas. Right down the road. So I'm kind of scrolling man, through. Got a lot of locals. Oh, yeah, man. We're we big in Texas now. Let me tell you what. Hey, it's a good thing, Jay, because I do have some Texas news uh, in the electrical front that we'll talk about a little bit later in the show. So if you're obviously you're an electrician in Texas, you want to hang around. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with GFCIs, so you'll want to know. Texas is trying to take the lead on something, but again, I don't know if you know. I don't know if it's the right move. Even though, whatever, we'll talk about that. So, if you're from Texas, hang around. We got some great Texas news uh, to release. Again, again, tonight is uh, May twentieth. Also, Jay, do you realize that I, I don't can't remember the anniversary when you came on, but I do know that I've been doing. Uh, electrician live version of the podcast for over a year and a half now right right a year and a half that's amazing because again yeah. shows come and go all the time but we've been put out quite a few shows so um thank everybody for sharing it and coming i love it um yeah congratulations so, man you built yeah. this up and i just you know I'm, i remember when you set out sent out the um application mm -hmm. for want to find a co-host so mm -hmm. you know you do a lot of podcasts you do a lot of teaching you're always talking to the camera right so i mean mm -hmm. this was something 
that's unique because we get to banter back and forth. We sure. get to kind of poke at each other, you know, like I can see that, that I thought you're a man. And so I look at your beard and it doesn't look like you can grow a full beard. But anyway, um, <laughs> my kidding, man. Thank I you, Jay. Too. <laughs> Appreciate it, Jay. I, I, I've got this. You know, you know what they say. They say Paul doesn't work anyway. This is baby skin. Okay. You know, my hands don't have any calluses on them. Paul's never done a day of work in his life. All right. It's all good. It's all good. I can, t- I can take it, bro. All right. Anyway, um, before we get into the night's topic and a broad discussion. Uh, which ought to help most anybody that's in the electrical industry because it does matter if you choose the right product for the right application and things like that. Tomorrow, my daughter turns one month old. Oh, congratulations on that. All right. Can I be the negative guy today? Can I be the negative guy, Jay? You ready? Yeah. Congratulations, Oh, Your child is one more day closer to death. No, I'm just playing. Oh, that's so... Hold on. That's just... Okay, lift me back up. I'm sorry. Congratulations. You know what? We're all getting older. I feel every day I feel like I'm getting closer to that box. I'm just saying. All right, go ahead. Nope. O's, O's, uh, that's awesome. And I, I don't know if that's O's first kid. I don't but, know. Uh, if, if it is, congrats. My little one, she is about 18 months now, and the time cutie. just flies by. So. She's a cutie. Uh, mine yeah. is 20, 23. So, all right. So, also, before we get into tonight's topic and in different discussions on everything, I want to say tonight's sponsor is, is going to be uh, Electrician Pride. As you can see down at the bottom, we have added a lot of stuff. Have you taken a look at it lately, Jay? Oh, my goodness. I have, actually. I'm, I've ordered the mug for the Master Electrician because, again, I, I don't really have um, many... Uh, like items that you sell that are for master electricians or, or electrical contractors, even my inspectors. So I did. I ordered a notepad. I ordered a mug. And actually, I'm about to um, get a O2. So, or an O. <laughs> I'm looking at it. You get an O2? <laughs> you get an O2? Uh, you could so be the we... electron, Paul. <laughs> negative. Yeah, That's right. Negative. That's there right. you go. It's his third kid. Be nice to O, man. He's got yeah, three kids. Oh, out my there God. Making yeah. it, man. Jeez, in California. Dude, where... three Three kids, you're a saint, bro. You're helping populate the community all on your own. Um, now, we have these hats now. Uh, again, in my effort to not offend everybody, I do have a hat that people seem to be getting offended by. But uh, we do have that one I like. It says, uh, I make miracles happen, and, you know, electrician across the front. And I'll, I'll be sporting that hat in, a, in a, probably about a week. Uh, it says, I make miracles happen, electrician. Underneath it says, so what do you do? <laughs> so that, I thought that was a kind of... Kind of a cute saying. Um, but yeah, we got the hats, the mugs, the people ask about stickers. We got stickers, but we also have magnets. Did you see that? We got magnets now. We got polo shirts with the new designs on them. I like the new one. It's like the logo here that I have on the screen. Uh, this is the red, white, and blue thing. Uh, so a lot of good stuff over there. You get a chance. Go to electricianpride.com. Check it out. Or you can go to our website, masterthenec.com, and you'll see the merchandise link. You just go right over there and highlight it, and boy, you can see. Come, um, man! This, wow. this, this, seven this chat line Hector? is getting crazy. <laughs> seven, seven kids, hey, Hector. Hmm. Wow, oh, are you man. a Mormon? All right. Anyway, so congratulations. I guess <laughs> seven. Oh, wow, that's a lot. That's a herd. You almost have your you own football uh, team. Right. Yeah. At least a basketball and a couple at of least. bench warmers. Uh, mm-hmm. Steven's daughter is almost 20 months. Wow, man. I'm telling you what, guys, my, my son is 15 and, and we just got done going to the store and, uh, um, the size of that freaking take, sticker, the size of your face. It is the size of my face. <laughs> that is a big sticker. I, I posted something up on, um, I think it's trade hounds or whatever of a guy that sent me the sticker. And it, it, it's on the side of his head. You might be, it might be you. And I post, ended up posting that hat on there and it was, thought it was the funniest thing. And, and, and it was our sticker. All we sell over on Electrician Pride is the big stickers. But the smaller stickers are going he to be. That was uh, me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The smaller stickers are going to be available on the website here shortly. The smaller versions, are the, at least you'll know what size you order. If you're not aware of it when you order these things, 
they are huge. So if you think you're getting one of these little teeny ones, right? You're not. No. <laughs> Electrician pride. Full size. Look at that. The, the skull mafia. Th these things are huge. So not necessarily for your, uh, not necessarily for your hard hit. Uh, they're actually from the, from the website. We don't ship directly. They're shipped for us. Uh, they might have an overseas option. I don't know. I, I really, to be honest with you, I've never looked at it. Okay. So check it out. Um, give it a look on the website. Go to electricianpride.com or just go to our website, Master the NEC. You'll see the merchandise tab. You hover over it. You'll see all the new stuff that we've added. There's a lot of yeah. stuff there. A lot Definitely. of stuff. Browse it, man. Get some cool stuff. Get your apprentices stuff. You know, that's what that's one thing that we always like to do is get our apprentices oh, yeah. stuff. And actually, I gave. Uh, you see a the bumper the sticker? With, when, you see the uh, bumper sticker not. that I have? You have a bumper sticker that you can put on the back of your work truck. It's very tasteful. It's the one that says, "I make miracles it happen." Not be something crazy. Mm 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 mm. But neat little bumper yeah, bumper bumper. You got a big one and a small bumper sticker. Anyway, over what were you saying? You give stuff to your apprentices. Yeah, so I had, well, no, my, my RWs, hold on, I got to uh, hook up my hardwire and my internet, but my RWs, when they passed their exam, I gave them the wizard sticker. Oh, electrical wizardry. Extra ones. The electrical wizardry, I love that. That's probably, yeah. that and the school mafia are my two, man, just because I, I feel like I'm, I'm a part of that. I'm a part mm -hmm. of that wizardry, you know, I'm always trying to pick up that knowledge and then the, just the kick-ass skull that's just in your face you know code mafia man. That's just, yeah most so. most of the designs that we do are going to be what trades people can use i'm not into the 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 ones that that are you know kind of cussy or show all this i'm not into that yeah. i'm sorry they're they're out there you can get them but mine are more you can use for a trade like the the newest logo that looks like the one on the screen next to me right here uh is an embroidery okay Speaking of embroidery, Jay, you're looking sharp with your, your, your hat and your shirt. And I had to step my game up a little bit. See? I had to, br I had to bring out the embroidered elect electrician live shirt. I had to bring it out for the show. Got to make sure that these guys know that they're listening, guys and gals, that they're listening mm -hmm. to professionals. You know, look yeah, look apart. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I was going to come on in a wife beater and a tank top, but, you know, but I decided <laughs> I wouldn't. I'd just come out with this and this be a little, just a little more professional. It is, you know. Um, so anyway, check that out. We all have beanies. We got little, we got beanies in all colors, you know, the, the beanies. That's a cool thing. All right. Anyway, tons of stuff. Go check it out. Uh, see something you like. Let me know. If you see something in one of our logos, it's not on one of the products and you want it, just let us know. We'll, we'll make it happen for you. All right. So let's get into tonight's topic, uh, to Jay. Oh, you know what? Let's go on and drop the Texas bomb first. I'll go on and get that over with out of the way. What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So in the state of Texas, to which I is located, um, the, there's been a administrative rule change from the Texas Commission of Licensing and Regulation. And you might have gotten an email. Some of you guys might have gotten it. Uh, if you're an electrician in the state of Texas and you subscribe to notices from TDLR, Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, uh, they have come and actually removed a GFCI requirement in the National Electrical Code for two full years. And that is 210.8F. That is the outdoor outlets. Okay, so this is not receptacle outlets. This is outlet. And of course, we have a definition of outlet. It's in the National Electrical Code. It's a point where we take power from the system. So it could be an outside junction box or hardwire. In this case, the reason they did this was because the rule would have required that an air conditioning unit outside, if it's 50 amperes or less, 150 volts or less to ground, had to have GFCI protection. Yes. Now, we've talked about this on, on previous shows about, man, GFCI is just going everywhere, and what kind of problems may this cause? But during the development stage, in the code panel stage, the interested parties, the stakeholders, were at the table. The people that represent air conditioning industry, the people that represent the electrical industry, people that re represent the inspection industry, people that represent manufacturers of those products, people from NEMA, all these people are at the table. And they pushed GFCI expansion. Just like we're put, they're pushing it for 2023 to be on everything. Okay. Now, I haven't done this, Jay, because my house is existing and I haven't done this. But I'm tempted to put my air conditioning unit, the 30 amp outdoor unit, 
I'm tempted to put that on a GFCI breaker just to see if this compatibility is just a bunch of BS because I know how GFCIs work and I don't think there should be a problem. But Texas felt like there was a problem. So I'm going to read you this and see their justification for removing that. Now, again, everybody knows my position on GFCIs. I think they work. I'm a little bit shaky now lately on, on AFCIs, but GFCIs function. Now, do I believe we need to expand them everywhere? Jay, I don't know. I mean, I don't think we need them in bedrooms and all these other living rooms, but outdoor outlets, the whole reason that 210.8F got in the code, and I'm going to remind you in Texas, folks down on TDLR, friends of mine, I'll remind you that that got in the code because somebody was killed. There's no quicker way to get something in the code than to have somebody get killed. Okay, that's what caused the uh, 120 volts or less uh, luminaire in crawl spaces to become GFCI protected because of a death. So, with this case, it happened because somebody died. That's what got it in the code. All right. So it's not just for the outdoor air conditioning unit and the disconnect, which is an outlet. Okay. Um, not just because of that, it covers a lot more than just the AC, but that's what kind of got the state of Texas a little bit ruffled up. So here's what they've done. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll read it to you just so you can see. Section 210.8F of the 2020 NEC requires certain outdoor outlets to have ground fault circuit interrupter uh, protection. Uh, and incompatibility between most GSCI products on the market and certain types of air conditioning and heating equipment has resulted uh, in the equipment failing by persistently tripping circuit breakers. The approaching summer heat poses a serious threat to Texas residents whose air conditioner systems have failed or are malfunctioning. Okay. Adopting the emergency rule would help keep Texas residents safe by ensuring insta uh, installed air conditioning systems are not subject to failure due to equipment incompatibility. Additionally, the department's technical experts now have confirmed that adopting this emergency rule would not have a negative impact on safety. All right, so let me let me give you this thing. I'll let you kind of, kind of comment on that, Jay, and then I'll I'll read something. I'll read a little bit more. Um, it also, well, let me finish this part and then we'll discuss it. It says, in short, the continued uh, application of section 210.8F of the 2020 NEC presents an imminent peril to the public health, safety, and welfare required adoption of this emergency rule on fewer than 30 days notice. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you right now, the stakeholders were at the table. There's plenty of air conditioners, I'm sure, that are out there that since this code has been in effect and it's been a requirement that they've been running fine on it. Yes, some things have a problem maybe, but again, I don't know if this is the air conditioning folks problem or the GFCI manufacturer folks problem, because I'll be honest with you, Jay, and we'll talk about the safety part for, for what you feel, but I, I just want to say something. GFCI devices only function when there's a current leakage of six milliamps and greater, we call it a five nominal. That's what we, you know, what we talk about, things like that. Right. But the National Electrical Code specifically says they're not to activate if it's four milliamps or less or six milliamps or greater. So is the problem with the GFCIs or is it the problem with the manufacturers of the appliances? Is it a problem with the manufacturers of the air conditioning equipment? And like somebody says here, they believe many splits have a problem. If, is there a problem with the mini split manufacturers? That's what should fix the problem, okay? If this is a serious concern, how come we haven't seen, I guess maybe it's too early, we haven't seen the manufacturers from Eaton, the manufacturers from Schneider, uh, Gen uh, GE, um, yeah. uh, Siemens. What is their position on it? What's NEMA's position on it? Okay, when I worked for NEMA, we would have had a position on this. This is not in the best interest of a manufacturer. But now let's talk about safety. I'm not hearing people telling me, and again, in Texas, the 2020 has been around a while now. I am not hearing anybody tell me, I guess, what was it, January 1st of last year? I'm not t anybody telling me that this is becoming widespread. So 
It's it's not here. I can tell you that. I mean, we. I mean, y'all put G F. Y'all y'all are required to put those on GFCI, right? Uh, yes, and I mean, even some jurisdictions that are on the 2017 are trying to enforce some of the 2020 code, and that's one of them. And I don't know if it's a big, big kick that they get out of because on the electrical contractor side, sometimes it's hard to get GFIs. So mm -hmm. sometimes I put in a 30 amp two pull 30 normal. And I make a comment on my, uh, you know, my thing saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to fail because I cannot get this GFI. It's coming in two weeks. But right. check everything else out. So I, I don't know where that stands, if, if, it's, if it's hard in Texas to get them or contractors. No, it's not. It's Texas. It, no, it's, it has nothing to do with that. The, the, okay. the rule says they say that it is a, a health concern and that it, and the, the rules in Texas say the rules in Texas say that the only way that the state can step in once they adopt something like the code, the commission can step in and say, I can change the code unless it has a negative effect on the safety. Well, if GFCIs are required because it's a minimum safety standard, they are literally removing a safety standard. They're removing something that was put in place because somebody died. That's good point. So... But their statement says that the emergency rule would not have a negative impact on safety. That is not true. Now, whether you believe in them being GFCIs or not, I mean, that's irrelevant. I'm just saying their statement, because the only way they can change it is to say that they can make a change because it does not reduce the not safety. safety. Right. Safety is not an issue to them. Yeah. So. The National Electrical Code, which is a minimum safety standard, requires the GFCI protection, whether you like it or not. It's in there. When they remove that, and here's the funny part. They're removing it for two years because they say that they believe by then that the manufacturers will fix the issue. I'm not sure there's an issue because I'm telling you right now, a GFCI is not like an AFCI. It's not looking for a waveform. It's looking what? For leakage current. Is the problem with the GFCI? Or is the problem with the air conditioning industry? And all we've done is identified a problem in that industry that they don't want to fix. So when the GFCI detected leakage or the potential for leakage current, then there's a problem. So is it the chicken or the egg? Where's the problem? Anyway, state of Texas says they're going to remove it. To me, that actually lessens the safety hazard. Okay. Why do I say that? Because if, you're, if your breaker trips... Because of this issue in Texas, hello, you can call somebody like Jay Grunberg. His company will come out, and if they have to, they will take that GFCI out and put a regular breaker in there if they determine that that would keep tripping. It can be resolved. It's not like you're going to have to go the whole damn summer without heat uh, or without air conditioning. Also, they say that it's been um, having malfunction. How in the world does that happen? Because that can't cause any problem with your AC system. Because in Texas, our power blacks out all the time at random. Now, it's never off more than a couple minutes. But when that happens, it can take an air conditioning unit that's running and shut it down mid-run, right? And then you turn, then the power comes back on in a 30 seconds from now, and, it, and it's back up again, and everything's running. How is that any different with a GFCI? There's nothing in a GFCI that should cause a problem with the air conditioning. Again, it's looking for leakage current. That's what it is. It's looking right. for a current that's not traveling on its intended path, and it thinks that it's traveling on a human or something, and then it trips. So obviously the problem's with the air conditioning, okay? But I just thought it was interesting, so let me kind of summarize this for all you folks in Texas. As of right now, you do not have to follow the requirements of 210.8F. You do not have to put your outdoor outlets. And remember, we're not talking about receptacles. We're talking about the outlet. Go to Article 100 and see the definition of outlet. An outlet is a point where you put a, a receptacle in it, which is a device, or you have a lighting outlet that you put a luminaire on. We're talking about the point where you take the power. That disconnect that's there for that air conditioning unit, that is an outlet. Even though it's a disconnect, theoretically, right. the point, because you're taking power from the branch circuit that's coming to it, that's now going down to your unit. It doesn't have to be just AC. It could be other things as well, okay? But as of right now, you do not have to put that on GFCI, okay? Even though the National Electrical Code says you do, all right? So, 
Hey. Anyway, just wanted to give that announcement out there for Texas. So it just came out today. It's fresh off the press so that you know. And, again, I don't buy their justification. Uh, their rulemaking body is uh, – their, their, their reasoning here, if you read it, their reasoning is a bunch of BS. But at the end of the day, they can do what they want. But let me get this straight. You are not lessening. Okay. The, I mean, you're not, you're not increasing safety and you're not lessening it by not having a negative effect safety wise. You remove GFCIs when the code requires GFCIs. It is not as safe as it was before that. I'm just saying. And, and again, I would hope some people would ask the question. Okay. I'm either here or there. Cause you know, but what I'm saying is I think you ask the question, you know why? Because you have to ask yourself, we've got to moving forward. Remember, in 2023, Jay, we're going to have GFCI requirements on everything. everything. Ranges, everything's going to be GFCI. So you've got to ask yourself, is it the GFCI or is it the equipment? Actually, I think what's happened today is if there is an issue with air conditioning units, they need to check themselves because they probably have leakage current that's beyond the six milliamps or greater. And that's the real significant problem because prior to this, who was actually watching the, the chickens? Okay. Who was actually watching them? Okay. Was it the Fox? Because I can tell you right now, if you've got leakage current on equipment like that, that would explain why the gentleman was killed, whether or not the installation was adequate or not. The air conditioning industry needs to check themselves. I think that that GFCI probably did what it was supposed to do. It detected leakage current. So I'm not throwing a bone to all the manufacturers of GFCIs. They know how I feel about this expansion. But before we go stepping into making everything GFCI, we need to find out, was it the manufacturers that are having a problem? Or is it the GFCI that has a problem? But obviously, Texas making this move does not make things safer. Okay? I'm just saying. Okay. Your power goes out because of a GFCI in the summer. You call an electrician, they'll come out there. If they need to replace a GFCI with a regular breaker to get you through, they can yep. do that. Not a big deal. Right. But once somebody gets killed by coming in contact with it, there ain't no going back from that. Okay? I'm just saying. So they're prosecuting in Texas two electricians for not putting GFCIs around swimming pools. Well, Texas alone. So last thing I'll say on this, and we'll move on to the topic. If somebody after today, Jay, happens to get killed on an outside piece of equipment that has an outside outlet connected to it, Could can happen. they can they sue the state of Texas? Can they sue the Texas Department of Licensing Regulation because their substantiation from their legal department is not adequate? They are definitely impacting safety by removing GFCI requirements. And they're doing it for reasons that are a little bit dubious. But at the end of the day, do they open themselves up to a potential lawsuit? Maybe. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Anyway, all right, so I'm off of that, Jay. What's your thoughts? And then we'll move on to tonight's topic. Uh, I just think uh, I just think for Texas, if, if that's the way you want to go, you know, and if you're a contractor, don't put them in now. Um, you know, the, like we've talked about on the show, you can always go above and beyond. Yep. If you have a garage full of them because you stocked up on them and you want to continuously charge in your customers for them which which we do because again a normal two pull 30 is 10 15 bucks compared to a two pull 30 gfci that's a uh, 75 to 100 bucks i mean sometimes it's just a, a little tip out there for you guys sometimes it's easier to get the gfci from like a if you're looking for like a two pull 30 or maybe 40 or 50 from like a spa setup Mm -hmm. And you actually buy it in the spa, and it's actually like twenty or thirty dollars cheaper than if you actually just go yep. buy the GFCI breaker. So, so keep that in mind as well. Yep. But uh, I'm not going to install them. If if Colorado said that, I would take the two years, and and again, I would have that sheet with me every everywhere I go. If if I, as a contractor, and I'd say, hey, look, look what call because maybe some of the well, inspectors I think the inspectors will know that because again, this this is put out by the state, so I'm sure it goes to all of the states it's the electricians you have to catch up with but uh at the end of the day oh i do want to give a shout out uh to demetrio just donated 19 dollars 99 uh thank you um because i'm probably, probably gonna I'm probably gonna need it jay after probably in the next couple of weeks i'm gonna be full-time uh electrical code academy instead of part-time again hopefully i don't know that if that's gonna happen or not man. but uh 
You know, it might become my full time day job. We'll see. Teaching that's, that's America, awesome. teaching America's electricians full time instead of part time. Wouldn't that be awesome? All right. So anyway, thank you for that donation and appreciate it. And again, remember, any of you can also donate the little dollar symbol down there in the chat. Just click it and donate. I appreciate everything. It helps us send out those stickers and stamps and things like that. All right. Let's go on to tonight's topic. Jay, not Harvey Weinstein is in the house. Uh, and all I should mention real quick, somebody posted this. Is this everywhere? Again, that was only a state of Texas announcement about the, uh, the new uh, rule that you don't have to follow 210.8F. Anywhere else in the country under the 2020 NEC, you got to follow the rule. That was just for Texas. Okay. It doesn't apply to anything else, only outside outlets. Okay. And in this case, it was done because they were worried about the air conditioning unit, which takes power from the disconnect, which is an outlet as well. So that's what applies to nowhere else other than Texas. Okay. So I want to make sure that's totally clear. So I don't get emails and have some nasty grams come to me. Uh, it doesn't apply to anything else, any other application in the code, only you in Texas, you get to scratch out 210.8F until January 1st of 2023. Okay. So it's not even next year. It's the year after that. Okay. Good. All right. Sorry. Got that that's clear. When the the new, that's when the new code cycle drops. So that, who knows if they'll yeah, try to. Yeah. But that's a new code cycle ago, but they move it to then because their statement was they believe by then the manufacturers of the breakers and the appliance people will have come together. I'm thinking the GFCI right. folks don't need to come together. I'm thinking GFCI folks are like, forget you, you know, uh, but uh, our product detects leakage current. Guess what? Your product's got leakage current. Ding, 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 ding. Your product's unsafe. How about that? That's probably and what I'll, they're thinking. So I'll let you know too, because I have a two pull 30 for my split unit on, oh, you? on my addition. So yeah, we did two split units, one in the, Oh, and you uh, in your GFCI? Bedroom. Yep, I'm gonna put it on a GFCI, so I'll, I'll let Sweet. you guys know um, how long down the road if I have any issues with it, and and if I do, I'll call the manufacturer and I, I try to be uh, proactive and kind of get the, to the source, you know. But get see, with see me. What they're suggesting get is, with so. me because I have a lot of those people that I'm industry connected with, and I'd like to oh, bend their sure. bend their ear if you have a problem with that. <laughs> but I don't think uh, we had another donation. Uh, hey. Lost three. You quit. God, I can't even pronounce that. But donated. 20 bucks. Again, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. All right. So let's get into the topic tonight. So Jay, we're going to talk a little bit about thermal plastic and thermal set insulation. All, all. You did one up. I had to. I had to. Low city, you, you did. You, you one sent it up. up. Him. Penny right. up, bro. You pennied up. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Appreciate it. All right. That's awesome. So, oh, Caleb. Still Caleb. I know who you were. I just got to, you know, all these names. All right. So anyway, so we're going to talk a little about thermal set and thermal plastic and what it is. So let's start with the basic product, non-metallic sheath cable. Okay. Yep. It's cost a fortune today. Prices have gotten outrageous on it. Somebody just sent me a picture of the day, like 150 bucks for a 250 foot reel of, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, 14, two or 170 bucks of 12, two. Um, and listen, it ain't going down anytime soon. Just trust me. I have a, a you know, I have inside knowledge of things like that. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't going nowhere. So just buckle down, make sure you price your jobs accordingly. Um, so that product has inner conductors inside of it that are, you know, obviously the insulated hot and neutral. Uh, they're called TW, which is T for thermoplastic, W for, for wet, but you can't use that product in a, in a wet location. Uh, it's also equivalent to THHN, which is T for thermoplastic. And which is a plastic, it's meltable. If you heat it beyond its temperature rating, it will start to deform. It will even melt. In fact, that's the, we recycle that all day of the week. Right. We, we, we rip that, rip that recyclable. We, we rip that, that thermoplastic off of it and we remelt it and we reuse it. Okay. We have a big recycling program at our, at our company. So, um, so at the end of the day, thermoplastic is susceptible to heat. A lot more than a thermal set would be. But I'll tell you a thermal set in a minute. So let's stick with thermoplastic. Yep. So the most popular wire that we would use in raceways or inside of MC cable or inside a tray cable, Jay, is, is going to be THHN. Right? Sure. No brainer. Yep. And all, mo all manufacturers that make THHN, it's also dual rated. It's THWN-2. 
Well, I shouldn't say that. Not all of them are dash two. But I can tell you, if you're designing a system, I would always select something that has the dash two on it. Always. Because that dash two will tell you that the insulation's rated for 90 degrees wet or dry. Okay. So that's going to help you when you're doing adjustment and correction, no doubt. So hopefully if you watched my derating demystified video and you'd, you'd understand what I just said. Um, so in a thermoplastic, we have to be real careful where we run it, right? So obviously NMB is a dry location only product. It's designed to go in the walls. You can't run it outside, okay? You can't run it out in, in a raceway outside. You can't even run it in liquid tight outside. That's a dry location only product. Even though the conductor's inside of it, are equivalent to THHN, and in most cases probably would be also equivalent to THWN-2. Uh, it's not for use in a, in a wet location, so you can't do it. So, but that's thermoplastic. THHN, THWN-2, that's thermoplastic. Um, you have THW-2, that's thermoplastic. All of it is a malleable, say that five times, it's a malleable uh, material, Okay, that you actually will, will uh, it, it can melt. It can be, and if you run it in an elevated ambient temperature and you don't do an adjustment and correction, then it starts to deform. Okay, if you don't size your raceways right, you don't take into consideration sidewall pressures and all that kind of stuff, and you run it and you run it through an elevated temperature area, it can deform. All right. right. So, one of the things about thermoplastic, and I'm just kind of talk about thermoplastic and we'll get it off the table. Um, so when you're choosing a THHN, THWN-2, which is the workhorse of the wire industry, right? That's what goes in most of your raceways. That's when it's going to go in most of your MC cables, most of your tray cables. It's going to be THHN, THWN-2. It's a thermoplastic. Um, even though it's rated for wet locations, that's THHN slash THWN-2, you can choose whichever rating you want for whatever application. It is not designed to last a really long time in a raceway underground, even though it's rated for in a raceway underground, it's only gets tested to submersion for a specific finite amount of days, like 21 days. And that's it. We don't know. You don't know what's going to happen 20 years, 15 years, and maybe you're installing it and you really don't care. But again, is something about the thermoplastic products is, is absorbing moisture into the actual insulation, which can weaken it over time. Although it's still listed, still fine to be used in those applications. If I'm going to have a volatile installation, folks, that, that I know that raceways get flooded all the time. You can't stop a raceway from getting flooded. You know this, Jay. Yeah. Um, you're going to get water in it. I don't care how t sealed tight you think that thing is, right? Yep. You're going to get, you're going to get, it could be PVC, flooded. EMT, ridge, anything that's outside. It will get, it'll get waters in it. Water in it. It's, it's going to happen. Yeah. So, if that's the case, I would recommend in any known installation outside that's known submersion and things like that, I would use uh, cross-link polyethylene. That's thermal set, and we'll talk about that in a second, but that's what I would use. Inside of buildings, normal wiring is great. THHN, perfectly fine. Put it in a building, put it in a raceway, whatever, inside of a building, inside the conditioned walls, it's all good. It's all fine. Even though the code and even though the standard allows you to use something somewhere, Sometimes it takes 30 years of experience to realize that's probably not the best place to put it. Uh, a great example is Jay could go out there tomorrow and put non-metallic sheet cable and stick it in the ground. And it will probably outlive Jay and it'll still work. That doesn't make it right. And that doesn't make it a concern. Okay. So thermoplastic is the great workhorse okay, when it comes to that type of thing. Now, sure. and you're going to see that in a lot of different products, but, uh, like MC cable, tray cable, AC cables, all those different things are all going to be thermoplastic. Okay. Just think of thermoplastic. Here's an analogy I give people, Jay. If you're thinking about, think of thermoplastic as a Hershey bar. If you leave the Hershey bar on the dashboard in the middle of the sun, what's going to happen to it? It melts. Oh, it's going to melt everywhere. Okay. Now, thermoset that we're just now going to talk about, thermoset is more like a birthday cake. When we mix all the ingredients together to make that thermal set insulation and we present it to you as a birthday cake, that's all it'll ever be. A Hershey bar, you can melt and reform it into an Easter. You can conform it into a rabbit. 
You can melt it into anything. With thermal set, you cannot. It will not melt. It will crystallize, but it will not melt. So um, now, again, that's relative. If you really heat it up, it obviously is going to melt. But really what happens is it gets hard and brittle and it dries up and crystallizes at a higher point than thermoplastic would. Now, both of them are rated 90 degrees. So we, as electricians, we got to still follow the 90 degrees, right? Still got to follow the 90 degrees. We still got to follow the rules. But the insulation rating is still the same. It's 90 degrees C. So electricians know adjustment and corrections. They know how to do that. They've, they know how to do this. Also, I should mention, thank you, Circuit Plus. A uh, donation of 20 bucks. Again, I appreciate all the donations. Again, appreciate. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for joining the show. Okay, thank you for joining. Um, so thermoset, that's referred to as uh, cross-link polyethylene. Basically, it's the actual PVC molecular structure that's actually cross-linked chemically in order to create a stronger molecular bond of all the element, elements that are involved in that uh, polymeric material. And so it's extruded onto individual conductors um, and it's used as jacketing material and things like that for cable assemblies, but its insulating properties are more resistant to submersion, there's more resistant to uh, it, any raceway that would be underground, that would be submerged, um, things like that, okay? So um, that product is where we start to see all of the products that are a little more resilient uh, and a little more tougher. It's got a little tougher insulation on it. So you've got the, the, most, the most common cross-link polyethylene product that everybody out there has used is called XHHW-2. Right? The X stands for cross-linking, X, obviously. You have two H's, that's high heat, so that tells you it's 90 degrees when it's a dry location, but even though it's XHHW, it's only 75 degrees if it's a wet location, which is why we put the dash two on the end of it. So remember that dash two should always tell you as an electrician that whatever conductors are inside this cable or whatever conductors we're dealing with that we're pulling in a raceway, they're rated 90 degrees wet or dry if you see that dash two. Now that doesn't mean you can use the ampacity at 90. Y'all all know that now, right? It means you can use it for adjustment and correction purposes. You can use a 90. But if all of your terminals were rated 90 and everything associated in the circuit was rated 90, then I could use the ampacity at 90 because everything's rated 90. But the problem is most things aren't rated 90. Most things follow 110.14C. So if it be either 60, uh, 60 degree rated or 75 degree rated, and you have to adjust accordingly. Point being, Cross-link polyethylene is what we call those products like XHHW-2, but also, Jay, RHH and RHW-2, okay? Because RHH is a rubberized, even though it's still just crawl, uh, it's still thermoset. It's not really rubber. It's a chemical process that's very similar. But for most of us manufacturers, it's not really rubber. Uh, it just keeps that characteristic of RHH, which is 90 degrees, um, and then you've got RHW, which without the, without the dash two on it, it's just 75 in a wet location where RHH can't be used in a wet location. Okay. But those conductors are also usually dual rated anyway. They're usually RHH and RHW-2. Right. A point being, both. yeah, point being, those are also thermosets. All of those, all of I'm talking about now is thermoset. It doesn't have a melting point the same as a thermoplastic product. And then, of course, the insulation gets thicker. So people ask, Jay, what's the difference? If it's the same type of material, what's the difference? Well, X is a certain thickness of insulation, depending on the size of the conductor. Then you run, jump up to an RHH, RHW-2, the insulation gets thicker. And then when it gets thicker, it also gets evaluated to be what's called USE-2, which is underground service entrance conductors. Okay. Now, there is a difference between what's called USE-2 as a conductor and USE-2 or USE as a cable, okay? One of them would be just an extrusion. There is no jacketing on it uh, or two layers. And when I say jacketing, think about THHN. It's got the nylon and then it's got the insulation. That's a, that nylon's a jacketing. So when we're dealing with USE, you're gonna hear people refer to that as a conductor and you'll also hear people refer to that as a cable. The answer to that question is it can be a cable or a conductor. If you're extruding it through the process of making wire, 
and it's no jacket on it. It's just nothing but thermal set insulation extruded on top of it. Then it's really no different than XHHW. It's just thicker, right? And when it's right. thicker, it can pass more tests like being direct buried and things like that, right? So it's just thicker. So what you see is every time you look on the wire, as the insulation gets thicker for one given size, okay, let's just say we're talking, Jay, let's just say we're talking, uh, uh, you know, one gauge. As they've got one gauge, as you go from X, HHW-2, to RHH, RHW-2, the insulation gets thicker, even though it's the same type of insulation. And then when it has that, it has USE-2 rating on it, it gets a little thicker, right? Because that's designed to be buried straight in the ground. So it's got to be a little thicker. Then guess what? If you want to step it up one step further, you become PV wire. Now, PV wire is the thickest, okay? And that is basically still thermoset. It's not, it doesn't melt like thermoplastic. It's more resistant to, to abrasion and things like that. The jacketing is much tougher. And when it gets to that thickness that it can be PV wire, that's when the National Electrical Code allows me in 690 to install it from the combiner out to the actual array. And it can be exposed. Of course, it has to be run under the arrays and things like now the considerations for damage. Okay. And, and well, Elwood says it's finely stranded, but guess what? Our PV wire is not finely stranded. It's not required to be finely stranded. Okay. Some people do make finely stranded, but our PV wire is not finely stranded. It's actually the same stranding. It is ASTM B8 stranding. Okay. So you can get finely strand, but a, a, a lot of ours is not, but it's still PV wire. So again, you can go with the finely strand. And if you do have finely strand, you got to make sure your lugs can handle finely strand and things like that. But it's just the thicker. Now, another misconception, just real quick, Jay, about PV wire is people think that PV wire, because it, let's say you have PV wire that's got a 2000 volt rating on it. They think that they can use that in a raceway inside of a building and take advantage of that 2000 volt rating. And the answer to that is no, you cannot. Okay. So there's a reason that that conductor, for example, the thickest insulation on a PV also is, is probably quad rated. It's probably rated as PV wire. Then it's also rated as USC-2. But then it's also rated as RHH, RHW-2. Because you get to pick how you want to use it. And why is that important? Remember I said you couldn't use the 2000 volt in a raceway? That's only to be used for DC side applications. Okay? From the combiner out to the array. But if you want to use it as RHH, RHW-2, then it has a 1000 volt rating. If you want to use it as USC-2, it's got a 600 volt rating, okay? So you get to pick what you want to use it as, but you don't get to waffle back and forth on what the voltage is. If it's PV, it can be up to 2,000. If it's RHH, RHW, it's 1,000. If it's USC-2, it's 600. And you say, well, why only 600 for USC-2 rating? Because UL-854 limits it at 600. It just draws a line right at 600. So could it be used for more voltage? Obviously, but when it comes to the standard, the standard tells you what the rating is, okay? So that one piece of wire, if it's 2,000 volt rated PV, it's covering 2,000 volts. It'll also handle 1,000 volts as RHH, RHW-2, and it'll handle 600 volts as USC-2. So the reason I say that is you gotta be careful. If you're trying to use it as USC-2 in, in an installation where you're trying to get the 1,000 volts, then it ain't gonna work because that's not how it works, okay? So the difference is again, thermoplastic is pliable, it's meltable. I'll give you another example, Jay, rooftops. If I'm gonna run conductors in a raceway on a rooftop, we have this thing called an adder we have to think about. So we have to know what the ambient temperature is and then we have to say, well, look, if that raceway or that cable is on the roof, above a rooftop, indirect sunlight, and it's less than seven eighths of an inch above the rooftop, then I have to add an adder. Now, what does that adder mean? That means it's a physical number that you have to add onto whatever the number would be for the, ad, for the ambient temperature. And then you go to the table and you apply a, a proper uh, adjustment for that. Okay. Um, so that's what the adder is. But if you stay above seven eighths of an inch, then you don't have to worry about the adder. Or 
you install XHHW-2, what the code says, and there's an exception in the code. And the exception in the code says, if you do XHHW-2 and you even installed it on the top of the roof, right against the roof, then you don't have to add the adder because XHHW-2 doesn't melt like THHN would. So there's an exception in there to be able to do that, okay? So um, it's so important. Now, again, you probably were flipping through the code. So this is an example where get very familiar with 310.4. Yep, that's where I'm at, actually. Yep, 310.4, you can learn all you want to know about the temperature ratings and uh, of, of the different things. But basically, I wanted to just give you the analogy. Be careful of where you install things because thermoplastic is like a Hershey bar, right? Thermal set yep. is like a birthday cake. Hershey bars melt. You can form it into anything you want. Once we mix everything together to make a thermal set, that's it. It is the only thing we can do with that is grind it up. Okay. That type of thing. So, uh, Harvey, uh, uh, Caleb says is an adder and multiplier. No adder is uh, when we're talking about the rooftop, it's basically a temperature value, a set value that you will add to the, the ambient temperature. And then you add them together and then you go to the table to apply, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, whatever it is, a 70%, 0.90%, whatever the value is uh, that you're going to be reducing the ampacity of a conductor, that's what you do. So you take the ambient temperature, and where do you get that value? You can get it from ASHRAE. You can get it from copper.org. You can get a free one that'll tell you what the ambient is for the three hottest day, hottest months uh, in your area or roughly in your area, and that's what you would use. And then the adder is just goes straight to the code, and it tells you if you install it less than seven, eight inches above the roof, then you need to add this, a different, uh, this additional temperature value to whatever the ambient temperature would be, and then you go to the table and do your, uh, your, your adjustment or correction, depending. So and I keep saying that adjustment and correction because I so forget which one is which. I try to correction C adjust. What is it, Jay? I keep, man, I teach this stuff for a living, and I still forget <laughs> half the time. Uh, oh, the temperature is a correction, and the number of current current conductors is an adjustment. Adjustment, oh, yeah. I forget and that. C. I should remember C for like Celsius. That's, that's how I should remember it. But I don't. Anyway, that's really yeah, the, the you, gist of it for, you know, that type of thing. For, for those that are out there that do have the 2020 code book, um, if you go to page 159, you will see at the top uh, table 310.15B1, which is the ambient temperature correction um, that you would take on top of that roof. Um, whereas yep. in the adjustment, if you just go one page over to 160 bottom left, that yeah. table is table 31015C1, and that's your adjustment factor for if you have more than three current carrying conductors. Yep. So that's kind of where you find it um, mm -hmm. in, in the code. And yeah, I mean, with, with both of them, you know, it's crazy as I was installing XHHW-2 today. Um, we did oh, yeah. a, there you go. Yep, a new build on a side of the house. We had... 200 amp service so we took the meter um, from the meter we sent the rigid conduit up um, to the weatherhead and we ran 4 uh, xhhw-2 aluminum and there you and go between the meter to the panel to the breaker because it wasn't an all-in-one it was a meter separate than the pan than the um, main breaker panel they're separate, so we had to uh, put a piece of pipe between them. Same thing. We ran four odds from the load side of the meter to the line side of the of the main service. And um, by I the way, Elwood, say... Elwood, none of those help. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I usually I know which one it is. So when I'm looking at it, I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna do an adjustment of corrections. That's why we. That's why people started saying D rating. For so many years because again they didn't want to be caught in a situation was like okay which one's adjustment which one's a correction okay correction think of c as in celsius easiest way to do it because adjustments okay both of them deal with ampacity or deal with amps so that doesn't help me any but appreciate the effort all right so anyway that's about the the most that you can get when it comes to thermal set versus thermal plastic hector, just look at, hector wants to know in texas with extreme temps how would you configure the adder wouldn't you go to that, 
the chart that yeah, you're saying, so, those manufacturers? Yeah, so in Texas, it actually, uh, the um, uh, copper.org, uh, as well as ASRAE, have a guide, and it covers every state in the country. Now, it might not get every city, but what you do is you basically would just kind of pick the closest one that's to you and use that. Is the is the is the value that you would use, and then you just add the adder. And again, the adder is, I believe, is I can't remember thirty three degrees Celsius or sixty degrees Fahrenheit. Yep, and it, and it is actually in the twenty twenty. It's three ten fifteen B two now, and that is where you would actually get that from. Okay, so anywho, that's your that's your rooftop. But hey. As long as you keep it above seven eighth of an inch, you ain't got to do anything. But you still have to adjust for the ambient temperature, which I think you know ninety percent of the people out there are more probably never do. But uh, you're supposed to. Same as the attics that we run these cables in in Texas. Do you really adjust for the Texas heat and what's actually in the attic? Probably not. But you're supposed to. But you probably don't. Again, houses aren't burning down, and we do have an overcurrent protection device ahead of it, so hopefully that should do what it needs to do and protect everything. But it could be a—you could end up having—you um, could end up having an issue where you have uh, excessive tripping because the temperature gets to a certain point higher because of the ambient temperature, and that's what they used to have a big problem out in uh, Arizona when you uh, when they would put the outside units outside. The, not units, the panels outside and they would be facing the sun and they would heat up and they would heat those breakers up and they would prematurely trip and that would be a, create a problem for them. Uh, Circuit says, I have a question about nylon. Before yeah, you ask well, that, it, was, it was a previous question. He said, is it true the nylon main purpose is just an extra layer of protection while pulling through waste, raceways? All right, so let me tell you about nylon because I didn't talk about nylon. THHN, the N stands for the nylon. You don't have nylon on, on uh, XHHW, but you do on THHN. That's what the N stands for. Nylon really serves two functions, okay? First role is that it helps reduce the coefficient of friction. So inside the raceway, most manufacturers are now going to put lubricant on their wire already, whether it's emulsified, comes through the nylon extrusion, or it actually is applied as a topical. Of course, you buy pulling, pulling lube for, for decades. We've been buying pulling lube. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is to lower the coefficient of friction during the pull. So what you have going on in a raceway, if it's a long pull, you have two different forces. You have lateral forces and gravitational forces. The lateral forces is the resistance to conductor, I shouldn't say conductor, the resistance to lateral flow of that conductor due to surface friction. And then, of course, you have the longer the run, you have gravitational forces that are coming down that affect the weight of the conductor itself is why people are using a lot of aluminum for longer runs because it's less weight. And, of course, less weight is going to have less effect gravitationally, and that's ultimately going to affect the lateral movement of that conductor. But if you put lube on it, it's supposed to reduce the coefficient of friction. Okay, Nylon with lubricant really works well. Nylon with no lubricant acts like a piece of sticky gum as you try to pull it through a raceway. You get so far and it's going to start to stick, right? That type of thing. So it works against you, okay? Um, typically, the coefficient of friction on a conductor with a pulling lubricant or something with a pulling lubricant applied to it is going to drop it down to like a 0 0.17, 0 0.14, 0 0.15, somewhere in that range. Um, and that's good enough to get you from point A to point B. That's not going to be a problem. The second thing, uh, okay, so that's the, the ease of pulling. Uh, the second thing is exactly what you said. It adds that extra level of protection during the pull. So you're not damaging the insulation. So I tell people out there all the time, nylon is not insulation. It has no insulation value, okay? It's usually like less than 10 mils thick. It's, it's, it's not there. It might even be less than that. It is, I can't remember, but it is, yeah, I think it's 10 mils. It does not, no, I think it's less than that. I think it's point, I think it's like four mils, depending on the size. Anyway, it's only there for, for to the lower the co help lower the coefficient of friction during the pool and to protect the insulation. That's it, okay? That's it. You'll also notice that equivalent size for like a 10 gauge THHN versus a 10 gauge cross-link polyethylene XHHW, the thickness of insulation is thicker on the X than it is on the T until you get to a certain point in size, then they start to balance out, right? Because X doesn't have the benefit of the nylon for protection, 
And it doesn't need to. The standard UL44 doesn't require it. Okay. Uh, UL83, which is for THHN, THWN-2. Okay. That's the nylons there. So that's two roles that it, that it spies. Now, I do have to tell you for my folks in Texas who might be down in Southern Texas and they might be working on an oil rig or something like that. Any installation that you're putting THHN, THWN-2 in that is a known oil and gas exposed and that, conduct, and that conductor has a GR2 or PR2, whatever it is on the side of it, that's to let you know that that is designed, it can handle an oil, oil and gas environment, but the nylon must stay intact. It can't crack off. It can't break off. If it's an oil and gas environment, so if I'm installing a raceway, maybe I'm doing a class one division one location or something like that, and I'm pulling wires in it and I'm using a make or break switch. that's inside of a oil immersed enclosure and I've got, and there's a potential for rupture or, or something, then I can't break that nylon. It has to stay intact. But any other time, I would say 99.9998% of the time, if the nylon cracks during the installation, who cares? It's only there to serve its purpose during the pull, and that's it. So other than oil and gas situation, which, again, is a rarity, I can't think of any normal application where you'd have the problem with the oil and gas and worry about it, except maybe, maybe Jay, maybe to a fuel pump dispensing. If you pull it and you're using that over to the fuel pump and it goes up in the fuel pump, then you could have an issue in there where you could have an, uh, somebody could argue that it could be a potential oil and gas environment. And then they're going to sure. want that nylon to not be cracked. But majority of your installations, who cares? And it is going to crack, Jay. I guarantee you in Colorado, your nylon on your conductors that you pull in raceways, if you follow the code and don't exceed 360 degrees of bends between pull points, you're going to crack that, in, that nylon. All the time, man. I, I see cracked nylons. In, in boxes everywhere I service. And most of the boxes that I see it in are pull, like light pull boxes that are missing the cover. I mean, you always get a kind of glance in there, right? You're, yeah. you're driving up to Walmart and you, you, you're facing the pull and you look and of course it's open. There's no cover at all on it. These mm -hmm. wires are sticking out and you look and you're, you're like, oh man, what the heck? And then you look at that uh, conductor and the nylon's cracked. Probably oh, yeah. because again, because that long run and and in due time, it's it's going to do that. So that's going to crack. Now the only problem that some people have, and they ask me how do we address this, they say, "What if I got an inspector who comes to me and says, you know what, I can't tell what wire you're using because the nylon's cracked.' Well, ding, 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 ding. If you're saying that, you should know that it's THHN, THWN-2. But anyway, they're saying, look, I can't see the markings on the product because the nylon's cracked off. You'll get that from time to time. Sure. And you have to look at the inspector and go the, and say, look, there's another end of it on the other end of the pool that isn't cracked off because it wasn't pulled in the raceway. Do you mind? Can we go look at it there? Or you can say, look, I'll show you the reel that it came off of. Or right. reach out to the manufacturer and you can find a bill of laden and prove it if you had to prove it. But why do you have to prove it? Okay. If, if you can see cracked nylon, then you know that it's got to be THHN, THWN-2. Can't be X because there's no nylon involved. So what's what's the what's the problem? So again, you might run into that. Um, I've gotten people call me and say, Paul, the wire's damaged because it's got uh, it's chewed up nylon or whatnot like that. And the answer to that is, are you dealing in an oil and gas environment? No. Okay, you'll know if you're in an oil and gas environment because you're gonna you'll be in a situation where you're gonna have seal offs and all this other stuff. Are you dealing with that? No. Okay. Well, guess what? Who cares if it cracks? Doesn't matter. It's not going to hurt anything. Now, the insulation is a different story. When you got thermoplastic or even thermal set and something damages the insulation and takes a big old cut out of that stuff, there is nothing that takes the place of insulation, guys. You can't wrap it in. You know, I, there's uh, funny guys over on the uh, podcast. Um, uh, what is his name? <laughs> Oh my God, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, and he always says, wrap some mofo tape on that or something. He's got an old saying that he says. Um, and he, sa he says, and uh, the reality is, you can't wrap. Electrical tape cannot take the place of insulation. Okay? Now, can if you I do it? Sure, you can try you to do wrap it. it and do it, but and it probably lasts fine. The purpose? 
No. So let me give you an example. So let's say my hands here, Jay, for those that are listening on the podcast, you can't see this, but say my hands are this, this right here is the surface of the conductor. Let's say I'm pulling it, it catches on a box and you get what's called a rabbit ear. It pops up. You see the copper, but it just pops up. You didn't lose any insulation. It just popped up. If I can lay that insulation back down and then I can wrap it in rubber tape, and then overlap it with a roll uh, with layer of electrical tape, then it's probably going to be fine. And you're not going to have a problem because you didn't lose the insulation. If you strip off insulation and it's gone and you now see nothing but copper or you see nothing but aluminum, sure. You can wrap it in tape. You can do whatever you want, right? Nobody's going to know, but you, however, that is not equivalent. Okay. Only manufacturers can put insulation on the conductor. That is not an equivalent. Your other options is to cut it and splice it but you can't put splices in a raceway. So, but of course, if it's in the middle of the raceway, how do you know it's cut? You don't know it's in the middle of the raceway, right? Um, I also have told people before, once it's inside of a box or an enclosure, it's less of a concern than it would be if you tried to look at damaged wire and pull it in a raceway, because you know it's in the raceway. If it's in a box, then it, we can probably do something repair it because again, lugs are exposed, okay? The end of the conductor that terminates is exposed. So I could probably fix it there, and, but don't pull a conductor that's damaged like that, that has insulation removed it, and then wrap it in tape and try to pull it in a raceway. It's not the best practice to do it. I know some people want to do that, but that's really not because you can't use electrical tape to put in. It's not insulation, okay? There's a difference. Insulation's there for a reason. Okay. Um, Jay, I know I'm talk, 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 talk. Any, any, any thoughts on that? That's uh, good knowledge. Good to know the difference. So, yeah, some things yeah, can be some fixed. These... Some things can't. Now, jackets, yeah. jackets on SE cable, jackets on trade cable, jackets on NND, things like that. The sheathing, the jacket sheathing, that can be replaced. We have kits that do that. 3M has kits that do that. I'm sure other manufacturers have kits that can do that um, and replace it. I don't even have a problem with tape on it to, to replace that or to fix it. Uh, unless, except for that's going to stand out and bring, bring attention to it. But other than that, um, you can fix jacketing. It's the insulation that we worry about. And that's the insulation on the actual conductors itself. It's there for a reason, that type of thing. Anything else with that? I'm sorry. I talked a lot tonight. I kind of just went rambling there. Sorry about that, Jay. No, I think you did great, man. A bunch of people had questions, and I think he answered them, especially Circuit Plus. Looks like he's going to be able to go tell his helper and explain um, about the nylon there and you what go. it's used for. So, yep. Absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. So what else uh, What else do we have to talk about tonight on anything? Uh, I know we're, we're, we're just past our, our normal hour, but everybody knows I'm a, I'm a rambler. Um, Exam yeah, I mean, prep. We could take any. Oh, exam prep last night. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a good good uh, class last night on. Um, Can't even box. remember, Kenny. No, no, no. It was. I'm trying to get my the, the <laughs> wire box. bending four oh, boxes pull. and and the dimensions of them with the U poles and and straight poles and and angle poles. U poles, straight poles. poles. U poles, straight poles, angle poles. Uh, interesting thing that we didn't talk about last night, Jay, was nobody, we didn't talk about splices. So splices no. in a box still follow the same rules as an angle pull. Okay. Right. So that, that type of thing. So, um, no, uh, circuit, we were talking, we talked about sizing pull boxes and how to size them based on the size of the raceway and, and also interesting, I explained to everybody what happens if you have like MC cable that comes to a box and you're going to be splicing in the box. You still have to follow the six times rule, even though you're, you're going to be using cables. And, but in order to size the box, you have to transpose, you have to take a cable and take all the conductors that are inside of it and do a calculation as if you were doing a raceway fill calc and determine which size raceway you need and forget, forget that it's in a cable and then treat it like it's a raceway once you determine the right size you need because cables don't come in trade sizes. And the rule says that you have to treat it in 314.28A1 and A2, you have to treat it as a raceway. 
And so you have to do a little bit of, uh, you know, you have to do a little math, that type of thing, and, and, and sure. figure it out. But uh, uh, that type yeah, of thing. Elwood says uh, conductors four and larger. Yep. yep. He was he was actually attended the class last night, him and O and mm -hmm. a couple other people that are probably in here. Um, Harley says, any advice on PSI masters in Maryland or pointers? Yes. Pass that biatch. All right. right. Oh, next. Here's 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 my tip, and and I'm pretty sure you're gonna mention that I've I've, I've probably stole this from you, but but oh <laughs> god, Look, I, he's gonna go through the thing that I've been him. teaching for 35 years, and I get no credit for it. Now everybody no talks credit. about it, but go ahead, go ahead. Nope, so, and and I have a guy who is testing out Monday for his RW, and I I told him this Harley, I said do three or more pass throughs um the first three. pass through three 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 you, you ain't got time three. but to do three you ain't got the time but to do three bro through, make sure you answer every question that takes you less than 10 seconds if not five seconds just get those questions out of the way the easy ones the ones that you've been studying the ones that you remember the ones that you don't have to really open up your code your first round this should not even be open all you're doing is reading the questions and really just browsing through and and you're getting familiar with the ones that maybe you don't know right off the bat, but you are answering the ones that you do know, and you're gaining confidence. And that's the biggest thing, because when I took my master's, the first five that I read, um, one through five, I, I had to look in the code book, and I had to do some extensive looking. So I was kind of like, man, when is this? Is it going to be like this the whole time? And once I went through all 100 questions, I probably knocked out about 40 of them. And I was building that confidence. The second time around, now you're going to go to the ones that you know the, where to find them in the article. So now you're cracking that book open. You're going to take about a minute, maybe a minute and a half. Because, again, you got to think you gained all those minutes from answering those questions really quick. Yeah. And then the third round, what would you say? Leave the calculations maybe or – yeah, so the, the historically, uh, what I teach people with this is in the first wave, okay, in the first wave that I go through it, what I'm doing is trying to answer questions that I know. There's a certain number of questions that things that you're just going to know, man. You put in the time, you put in the hours, you've done the training, you flip through the book. You, you, there's things that you know that even some people say they, they might not know, but you know, and... At the end of the day, think about the concept here. I want to go through on my first wave, and I'm trying to build me what's called a bank of time. Okay, that's how I equate it to people. Build yourself a bank of time. You're a certain number of questions that you're going to have, and you simply look at the amount of time that they give you in the exam. You do a little math there, and you can determine how many, how many minutes you have per question, right? Okay. And first wave, you're going to go through, like Jay said, and you're going to just answer what you just know. Because you know what? Your gut is usually right. Okay? Go through and answer what you know. If you get one that you're like, well, I know this, but, oh, God, I don't know it. Then that doesn't qualify. You mark it. Because you're going to look at that on the second wave. But the first wave that you're going through, you're going to answer what you know. Without a, without a doubt. If you get a question that says you're securing non-metallic sheet cable between, uh, between secure points, how many feet can you go? Four and a half feet. You know this. Boom. So you mark it and you move on to the next one. You just bought yourself about a minute of time. If you go through that first wave, you're going to have an additional amount of time that you've bought and you've narrowed down the number of questions you have. So what do you do on the second wave? So most of the electronic systems that do these testings now will allow you to mark a question. So when you're going through that first one and you get to one, you just don't know the answer, you mark it. Then you go to the next one. If you know it, you answer it. If you don't know it, you mark it. Okay, until you get to the end. Now in the system, usually it'll let you go back and look at the questions that you marked. Obviously in the first wave, any calculation that you run into, unless you have a two-part test. If you two-part test, it's a little different, right? But... What you do is you actually will go through any of them that are calculations. If it's on the same test, like a journeyman's test that has both on it, mark the calculations and move on. Okay. So the first wave, you answer what you know, mark what you don't know, mark calculations and go to the second wave. On the second wave, you're specifically answering those questions that you put a check by. And you're going to spend about two minutes on a question. Okay. On the first wave, don't spend more than a minute on a question. If you got to sit there and really rack your brain for a second, don't spend more than a minute. On that second wave, okay, then what you're going to do is you're going to do all those ones that you marked in the first wave. And don't spend more than two minutes on there. Otherwise, leave it marked 
and go to the next go to the next question. Okay. Once you get through there, then you're going to have some of them that you actually answer. Then you're going to unmark it because you've answered it. Then you're going to go to the third wave. In the third wave, you do not leave a question unanswered. Okay. So you're going to go through it. You're going to answer your questions. By that time, you're going to work on it. But in the third wave, you're still not going to spend more than two minutes on a question. Cumulatively, you've spent over four minutes on a given question because you, you did it in the second wave and you passed on to the third wave. So you should have enough time to find those answers. Okay. In the third wave, now when you get to the calculations, you're going to work, you're going to work these calculations. On most tests, even if you skip the calculations, you could still pass the exam. Unless sure. you're in a two-part test, like Texas. For masters, it's a two-part test, right? But yep. that's three waves, uh, and you simply go through it. And what you're doing is trying to buy yourself extra amount of time. Um, if you find yourself running out of time in an exam, then to be honest with you, you just weren't ready, okay? Uh, because if you run out of time, it's usually not because of calcs. It's because you're having to use the index too much. So, Jay... There's a method to my madness. When I teach a class and I tell you to dissect a question and some people say, why are you spending 10 minutes on one question? We're not going to get that many in an exam. I'm doing it because I want you to dissect the question so you can learn what is and what is not in the index. Why? It also helps you understand the question better. But two, it kind of gives you a, a, a heads up of what's in the index so that you're not spending your entire exam question uh, exam in the index because that's going to eat your time mm -hmm. okay so there's a method for doing it whether or not uh, you know it is or not but there is a proper method to study and that's what i like to teach and talk about certain methods to study okay but i think you'll knock it out of the park um yeah i think what elwood said that's how he did it he did it the wave uh loss said he did it he did it three waves and and uh what did, it, what did he say? He took his journeyman's in May 1st, missed six out of 80, used all four hours. Absolutely. That's right. Don't, do not feel like you're setting some kind of record and get out of there. You know, that's not necessary to do that. Um, when I took the Texas exam, obviously, obviously I, I helped write the test. So, I mean, obviously it seemed some of those questions that were like, hmm, that looks familiar. Uh, but I didn't need to spend the whole time. Obviously, I got in and out of there, and I think it was an hour and 15 minutes um, in and out of there for the, the calculation portion and the actual uh, uh, lookup portion. But, I mean, I do this for a living. So, you know, it's not the same thing. Remember, Jay, people say I don't work anymore. This is what I do. I, I, don't, you know, I don't have calluses anymore. Okay, Paul's not an electrician. He's just a teacher. Right. You know, that's what they say. So at the end of the day, follow that method. And that's the best advice I can give you. Uh, the other part of it is don't beat yourself up over it. Get yourself some good test questions. Even bad questions are good questions. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but bad questions make you think, right? They make you think. And it's okay to second guess yourself in the learning stage, that type of thing. Um, Demetrio says, what does he say here? Oh, Robert asked him, I want to record the webinar. Again, I should mention that if you want to get in on that, this, this is uh, it's actually winding down here to the log to be able to sign up for it. I'm doing a webinar on Saturday. I can't for the life of me forget, forget remember the exact time. But anyway, everybody that signs up for that, go check it out. It's on the website. Um, I am uh, doing a, a webinar on feeder taps and secondary conductors. Uh, it's two hours, so we are going to try to pack a lot in two hours. Everybody knows me, long-winded, but we're going to try to get it done, okay? So that is this Saturday, okay? So if you're interested in that, now as far as recording it, I haven't made up my mind yet, Robert. So um, if I choose to record it, it'll be made available for people to purchase after that. Um, but I, I really haven't made up my mind yet on that, Robert. I, the, the going answer today is probably we'll record it. Okay, but I just don't want to, you know, do that type of thing. Um, what does Demetrio say here? Um, he said, I'd like to know what happened to the single phase one in service and feeders 310.15. It's still in there, Demetrio. Just got moved over to 310.12. So if you're talking about where did it go. The 83%. It went, 
Yeah, the 83% rule based on the rating of the service or feeder uh, disconnect is still in there. It's just moved to 310.12. It's no longer 310.15B7 anymore. So it's still there. Hasn't, hasn't gone away. Just kind of boop, moved up a little bit in the front of the book. 2020 code, they redid 310 a lot. So everything got moved around in 310, that type of thing. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's funny. A circuit plus says, man, the first time I took my master's, good Lord, I had too much confidence from my journeymen's and just went for it. My second time, I used a three-wave method and just <laughs> saved myself so much time. Sir, circuit it. plus, you, you have to know the humor in that statement. There's humor in that statement, and I can appreciate how he said that. And whether he meant it or not, I can appreciate. He goes, I had too much confidence from my journeyman's when I, and I went from it. Then he goes, my second time, <laughs> I used the yeah. three ways method. So basically he was saying, I went in there overconfident, cocky, and got humbled a little bit. And then used yep. the three ways method, three wave method and boom, got through it. You it's, know, it's, it's I, a I was method. the same way on, on my masters. I did the three wave or I, I didn't really know the three wave technique. I just kind of, um, literally YouTube how to, you know, the, the, how to be successful in an exam. Cause again, I study all the time. I was, I was hitting the books, man. I, you, you know, when I study for an exam, because you'll see this friggin' code book with me everywhere I go. I mean, I, I'll have it right next to my bed. I, I sometimes I'll s slip it underneath my pillow just to get that mm -hmm. much closer to it, man. And, uh, and I went in same with, with circuit plus I went in the first time for my masters and I failed. And, and I think a tear dropped out of my eye, man. I was so sad. And then I scheduled it for the next week. Again, some people will, Hey man, I need to, I need to take uh, three weeks off and study some more. No, 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 man. Jump right back into it. That next week, schedule it that next week later oh, yeah. and go back into it, you know? And, and that's what I did. Cause uh, the exam center, they showed me what I struggled in and it was PV. Mm -hmm. I struggled in PV. And so what did I do? I went back home and tightened up my PV um, knowledge in the code and boom, I, I passed it the second time. But yeah, if you're out there and for some reason you guys don't pass, I'm not saying you you won't, but if you don't, don't be afraid to take that exam a second to third oh, hit time. It. I remember one guy in our group, what did he say? He took it six times. Man, mm -hmm. when he passed it that seventh time, he was the proudest. And it oh, was, yeah. It brought you know what? I use, us, you know? I use this. I use the analogy, analogy of a doctor. If I'm going in there for brain surgery and people probably have sent me tons of emails that say I do need a brain analysis. But if I were to go in and do this and I'm looking at my doctor, I'm not going to say to the doctor, how many times did it take you to get your license through the licensing board? I'm not going to ask the doctor, what, where was he in his graduating class? All I'm going to see right there on his name tags, it says doctor. Okay. It doesn't matter whether it takes you six times to get your journeyman's or your master's or four times or three times or 10 times. It does not matter at all. Once you get it, you got it. You've earned it. Okay. Some people test well. Some people don't test well. Um, the reason that I do the fast track course and I make you do a lot of reading, obviously everybody knows I could do videos on everything. Okay. Obviously they know I've got the equipment and got everything to do videos. Why do I force you to read things? Because typically the reason that people fail is because of reading comprehension. Sure. If you crack that code book open and you look at a rule and you read it and you have to say, I mean, everybody's got to be honest with themselves. If you read it and you go, what the crap did I just read? You've got reading comprehension problems. And guess what? <laughs> That's okay. Hell, I got reading comprehension problems, but I like to think it's my ADD. I can't pay attention to anything anytime soon. Somebody be talking to me. I'm already starting something else. That's the only way that I can multitask. If I didn't and I was too focused and I couldn't get things done. Um, no, our fast tracks does not count for CEUs. Um, it'd be hard for that to work at CEUs because CEUs typically have to be code changes. And even though we talk code changes, it's self-paced. It's not classroom and it's not instructor led. So you couldn't use ours for any CEU training, no. Now we do have CEU classes available on our website through our hosted partnership with my CEU Depot. Um, but no, our Fast Tracks isn't designed for that. It's designed to help you get your license, that type of thing. Um, anywho, I don't even know what I was talking about. 
Um, you were talking about reading comprehension. And oh, yeah. So see, 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 I got ADD. I can ADD, stay on topic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, reading comprehension. So there's a reason why we do it a certain way. And that's why all of our questions in our competency reviews, the majority of them are not A, B, C, and D options, right? You've right. got to answer it. You, I mean, you, have, give to give an, you have to give an answer. To you have to give a code reference. I do not do the CEU courses. No. They're all, they're all online and may, mainly, I'll be honest with you, Circuit Plus. Let's, let, maybe, let, me, let me explain this to everybody out there who might watch this or watch it in the future. Obviously, I have C, I'm able to give CEU credits in about 30 plus states. But that's butt in the seat type of CEUs, right? Most of the reason I don't do the online stuff personally is because in order for me to develop the material, it's quite expensive. Yeah. You can get online through us with our partnership for, I think it's like 17 to 20 bucks for four hours of training for Texas license renewal. It would cost me more to develop it and advertise it and market it and do that. And what would I get? A few sales here and there? It's not worth my time. Okay. So we partner with somebody and they created and they went through the work of doing it and they market it and then they sell it all over the country and they have to pay for the advertising. I'm not interested in that. So I don't do that. So that's why we don't do that. Now, before COVID, I was known to go around and do them in different states and things like that, but that's a butt in the seat and it's a lot more expensive than what you do with this online education. Uh, in yes. fact, I even did my, even though I am licensed to give continuing ed in Texas, I didn't even do my own. I actually used our own My CEU Depot in our partnership to get my four hours, uh, and I paid what everybody else would pay. Okay, that type of thing. So, at the end of the day, I, I couldn't develop CEU classes. And uh, now, once I go full time, maybe that'll change, Jay. Maybe, maybe I'll I'll have, change. Maybe I'll change, and I'll sit down and write some information because I did. And I do get a lot of people that say, "God, I." I sure wish you would do my continuing education uh, because I do put, I will say, I do put on a quite of a nice uh, uh, CEU class. Uh, if you ever get a chance to attend one live, I will make you laugh. Um, but anyway, that type of thing, say. Uh, but we do so, uh, have, we do have uh, Circuit Plus. Again, we do have the partnership online, and I believe that they are much cheaper uh, through our partnership. Um, and it's good training because I took the training. It's code. It's code. It's code. But you'd go to our website and all of that information's there. It says continuing, uh, continuing education and check it out. You might find that it's very good priced and everything like that is for you. And you can get your credit right there from our website. Yeah, and Hector says, uh, but because of your show, I have asked inspectors to show me or tell me or, or I tell no code states this. And mm -hmm. I show them that they say, and I show them pretty much what it says and then they give them the green tag. So Pretty much what Hector's been doing is he's been watching our shows. He's been getting into the code book, listening mm -hmm. to us. Because some co some of the electrician lives, man, we get really in depth into the code. Um, that's where um, you can kind of learn a little a little more than normal. But if you really want to learn the code, they need to get into your programs and and really hit it con consistently. Um, the electrician what do I live say? Really isn't. What do I say, Jay? What do I say about uh, what do I say about inspectors when they when somebody tells me or anybody tells me that you can't do this because the code says this? What's the what's the first thing that give, I always give, say? Give a code reference. Yep. Show, Show me. me. Show me. Show me. Put up or shut up. Okay. And that's I don't want to hear. Says. Yeah, I don't want to hear what I don't want to hear that Johnny said. Billy said that you can't do this, and this is what the code says. And I'm going to look at you and go, really? Show me. Show me. Then you can fail me. But if you can't show me, don't be bringing me this crap about, well, I would prefer you do it this way. I don't care what you prefer. I don't work for you. Okay? I follow the minimum safety standard of the code. Okay? Unless your state's modified it or done something else, if you want to go above code, go above code. But I'm going to at least meet the minimum code, and you, Mr. Specter, are going to sign off on that green tag and give me my damn pass. That's right. Because if you don't, I'm going to go over your head, okay? And that's fundamentally how it should be, okay? We don't need inspectors with God complexes. Their job is to look at inspection, make sure it's the minimally safest inspection that you can get, and then move on to the next one. Go. 
leave, go, go to the next one. And I'm not bashing inspectors. I was one. Okay. I oversaw many of them. I was the same way then as I am now towards that. Okay. That type of thing. And, and my approach to it sometimes is a little more, um, subtle, I guess I say, Hey, you know, my guys, cause I don't really do the install much anymore. My guys are out there. My RWs and, and, and their apprentices are out there. And, are, you and they wanna know, they... are you getting soft like me? Are you getting soft like me, Jay? <laughs> no, You're not out there doing the work. I am getting a little soft. Um, and, and I go to the inspector and, and I say, hey, you know, in order for me to teach my guys what they're doing wrong, can you show me a code reference? You know, because we want to understand why you're failing us for this installation. And we also want to understand where in the code we see it so we don't do it again. And and again, if you can go either approach, um, either way, you're, you're not wrong. They need to provide you a code reference at the end of the day, whether you're shouting for it or whether you go a different approach with them um because like you've told them before they're like a pig pig and mom man they they want to they want to get in that mud they want to want to argue with you yeah and there's some great inspectors out there don't don't oh, get me wrong sure, i've got sure. a bunch of friends i taught quite a few inspectors out there which contractors hated because they were like dude i never got failed for that until you started teaching them and i was like just do it right and you don't have to worry about it okay that's what i always tell people when they worry about things i'm like just do it right and if there's an argument about something in the code that, that y'all don't y'all disagree on, then again, then you remember that if there's something that is a, a plausible argument about whether the code is stating something, then the AHJ takes precedent because their interpretation of it is what's got to go. However, there is a lot in this book that is black and white. Yes, there's gray in here, but there's a lot that is black and white, right? For example, if I'm installing, and we had a reference here to MC cable, metal clad cable, uh, the requirement is to secure and support it every six feet, but it also requires me to secure it within 12 inches of a box. If that's black and white, that's a measurable value. If I put it at 13 inches from a box or I secure it and I support it every eight feet instead of six feet, I'm not following what's written in the code. Yeah. That's black and white. Okay. Um, I had people ask me one time, Jay, they said, Paul, would you fail me if I put a receptacle at six and a half feet from the door opening? And Jay, you know me. What do you think my response for that would be? Of course I'm going to. Yeah. Of because course. the code says you do it, but the receptacle can't be more than six feet. And you have other options. If you can't put yeah. the receptacle on the wall, you can go within 18 inches of the, of the floor. You yeah. can put a floor box in. So there's other, you know, there's, there's other there's arguments options. around. Yeah, there's options. So I, yeah. I get that one. That one's black and white. Yeah. That, so that's the thing. Now, there'd be some areas in the code where you could argue that are gray, and it's all based on interpretation. Just remember that the HJ's interpretation is going to take precedence. So right. part of your challenge is to try to have a man-to-man -man or man-to-woman or man to binary or non-binary person or whoever the person is or gender challenged person, whoever they are, have that conversation. And it's your responsibility to present your argument. And if you present it well enough, you could have an inspector go, you know what? I agree. And I just learned something today. I agree. And here's your green tag and you have a nice day. Or you could have them argue with you. And at that point, it's not black and white. It's a little bit gray. They are not seeing your way. Then what happens? Okay. There you go. Paul <laughs> said ginger challenge. I like me some ginger, so I don't, I'm sorry about that. All right. So anyway, get at it out there, guys. I'm telling you yep. right now, make people show you code references. People know me, know for years that I give code references on almost everything that I tell you. If I tell you something, I'm going to give you a code reference. Otherwise, I'm just talking out my butt, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you a code reference. You like me, hate me. If you get offended by me, I don't lose sleep with that either. So at the end of the day, I train everybody. I don't care whether you're black, you're white, you're green, you're yellow. I don't care whether or not you're a man, you're a woman, you're gender challenged, you're a ginger. I don't care. I teach code. And guess what? This right here mm -hmm. doesn't discriminate and neither do I. So when I'm teaching something, I don't care whether you're a Democrat or you're Republican, you believe in God or you don't believe in God. I don't care if you're an atheist. I don't really care. 
Okay, I worry about Paul. But I do care that you learn the National Electrical Code. And that's what bonds this all together. I might not agree with you. I might not agree with your belief. I might not understand. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You not, might not like the fact that my hat says God. I don't care. Why does that even matter? We're teaching the code. It just doesn't matter. Yeah. This is up to me. This is my preference. It's not yours. That thing. So God, today, I don't know how I got on that, Jay, but everybody gets their butt hurt today or get offended or the woke culture or everybody gets offended by anything you say. I'll go on and say this out of the way, Jay, because you know how I am. If I've offended you by anything I've said tonight, thanks for joining us on Electrician Live. I expect not to see you here next week. All right? And if you... <laughs> hey, and if you do like it, go on to the um, Electrician Pride, the oh, sponsor yeah, of the day, and go get yourself some swag, man. Yeah, I got some swag. swag. I, got, I got one that says... Uh, uh, what is, what does it say? It says pro-life, pro-God, pro-gun, electrician. Okay. Th that might offend some people, I guess. Don't you bring religion into this chat. Everything goes bad. I, last I checked, Jay, this wasn't a Masonic lodge, so I can talk, we can talk about all kinds of things. So, um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff over there. Um, yeah, get you some swag on. Go, go, go check it out, man. Um, yep. and we will have some. We'll probably have about the the next four up and coming topics um, this weekend. So keep a lookout. I know that Circuit Plus he was able to actually use the website and know what this episode was on. So that's why he was able to ask questions. And also, mm -hmm. if you guys want to hear us speak about something, give us a shout. Um, yeah. Was that host at electricianlive.com? Yep, hosts. Dennis, host hosts. at electricianlive.com. You're freed up. Boop. Of course, you can also go to electricianlive.com website and post something there as well on the actually, you know, the contact us button. If there's anything you want to bring up, I think there's an S on that. I think it's hosts. I, I, I think so too. And I accidentally hit the electricianlive.com. There it is. Boom. All right. All right. The first one I'll get rid of. Yep. No worries. So, Again, great topics tonight. We appreciate all of you for coming. Uh, and uh, again, uh, tonight's episode, again, again, to Texas, to Texas electricians, you get to ignore 210.8F for two years. Okay? Two years. All right? And then you gotta, you're going to have to require it again. So, hey, let's see what happens with that. I, I, I'm anxious to see if there's a response back from NEMA. Uh, or there's a response back from the manufacturers of the GFCI devices and how they're addressing this. Because basically, if you read that alert, they're basically saying your GFCIs don't work. So we're getting rid of them because they don't work with the air conditioning units. My response would be, well, if you keep the current from leaking on your product, then I wouldn't have to worry about it. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Okay, so... <laughs> Michael Schwartz says, "Great uh, episode. See you on Saturday. It's it's always a pleasure with with uh, Schwartz, man. He's a yeah. he's he's a he's in it, man. He's, he's, he's testing work. testing, I believe, this week too, or next week or whatever. He's I think uh, I think he's doing some testing. Okay, yeah, good I good believe. luck to him. Circuit Plus, he's going to be playing this show in the the morning uh, on the Klein speaker. There you go. Get those guys uh, all speaker. educated up." Milwaukee? Where's your Milwaukee speaker? Come on, man. What? Whatever. Get a Ryobi. <laughs> Since just... Spark, yeah, I know you came late, but uh, thanks for joining us tonight, too, yeah. Will, and everybody else out there. How about that sinister Sparky? Mm. Sparky. Yeah. Again, massive stickers. Bigger than your whole face. These are not going to go on the hard hat, guys. <laughs> so, okay. He says, yeah, bro, we don't take trash to work. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Come on. He's a, he's a DeWalt guy. Yep, see, I said DeWalt for the win. Yeah. Hey, get your, get your, get your uh, freaking upgrade Black & Decker and take it with you. Whatever floats your boat, man. You know, hey. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Again, I you use Ryobi, DeWalt, some people, Bosch. I, I get it, man. Use what 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 fits you and, and whatever run works it, for man. you. Yeah, whatever, whatever works, works for, you. for you. Whatever works for you. So, <laughs> all right. 
All right, guys. Well, that's going to be it for tonight's show. Again, we appreciate you as always. Um, again, if you're interested in learning the National Electrical Code at a better level, get the Fast Tracks program. If you're interested in our residential, commercial, industrial wiring, grounding and bonding, or anything like that, check out the website, masterthenec.com. Ask any questions you might have on it. Um, if you're in Colorado and you know somebody that wants some electrical work, make the, make sure they look up the basement king. Okay. That's right. Okay. That's right. Wired up electrical design. Got to get him hooked up. All right, guys. Till next time, stay safe. God bless. Appreciate you all. Peace out. Electrician Live with your host, Paul Abernathy and Jay Grunberg.